Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, also dear students, welcome this morning at the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome as our speaker, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Deputy Prime Minister of Slovenia, Tanja Fajon. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, Minister Fayon has a long experience working in European politics, uh, but I think today the, the best introduction is saying she worked in, for media for a long time. Mm -hmm. Being a journalist means that you have to communicate, be able to communicate, uh, and uh, Madam Minister worked for actually press, for radio, and for television in Slovenia, and was long-time correspondent in Brussels also for RTV Slovenia, uh, but uh, her background is also political science, management in the Plate Management Center, but also studying uh, in, in Ljubljana itself. Uh, and then came the, started the political career. She was three times elected to the European Parliament um, and uh, was responsible for, I would say, for all these issues which really matter, the values issues in the European Union, from uh, gender rights, minority rights, uh, to foreign policy issues. Uh, and uh, uh, in the year 2020, uh, then she really had to, to, to take it all. She became member of parliament uh, in Slovenia, deputy prime minister, as I said, and foreign minister, and she became the, the president of the Social Democratic Party uh, in Slovenia. Uh, so there's a lot of on, on, on her table, and I'm very happy that she accepted to, uh, to uh, talk with us, and we said uh, there will be an introduction on the issues of Europe, global situation, but also the Balkans, certainly, uh, and then we will have a, a Q and A. Um, Minister Fayon uh, will uh, later on join the Central Five meeting mm -hmm. uh, here in Vienna uh, for discussing regional issues, mm -hmm. but not only regional issues. Minister Fayon, the floor is yours. Shall I go? Yeah. Thank you very much, um, mm. Mr. Briggs, and mm. it's uh, very good for me to be here. I'm very honored to have an opportunity to discuss with you. I decided to put my notes away because I like to speak and I think it's better interaction. And you well um, used my words, being a former journalist, that it's important as a politician how we are capable of communicating to the audience. And I used to say, um, I was privileged to be a journalist because as a politician, if you don't know how to communicate, you can have brilliant ideas but you will not manage to convince people to follow you. So having this experience from journalism is a good one. I don't say that I am for that the best leader in my country, but I'm at least the first female foreign minister and the first leader of a social democratic party being a female too. So for that reason, I think it's one part of communication that um, I benefited from. But once again, um, warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for inviting me. I'm using the opportunity as I am for the first time in my uh, good year of mandate in Vienna. Yesterday I was in United Nations and in um, EOSC and um, Energy, or Atomic Energy Agency. Today we have a C5 meeting with five ministers from the region discussing regional important issues. So it's uh, good to, to use the opportunity to present some of the positions. You presented a topic, enlargement, engaged, um, Europe, and this is something that is very close to my heart. But I will start with a broader context because I just came from New York where we had a General Assembly high-level week last week in New York, and I was also in Boston when I had on Friday an opportunity to speak with Harvard students on the same topic. And um, this was a very good opportunity to think where is Europe today in a geopolitical broader context. And that is where I start today's presentation. In New York, um, I'm often faced with, you know, a real world of today that is deeply polarized, where you have a multilateralism that is 
truly jeopardize the system that doesn't function the way we used to see it, with 55 armed conflicts all around the globe, and also the brutal Russian war in Ukraine. But speaking about the global issues and the global context, we're having conflict around the world. We're having extreme weather conditions, climate change, where we have um, poverty, where we have um, energy, food insecurity, where we have a lot of challenges that are global in common. We in Europe, we also have to be aware what this geopolitical context brings to us. What are our challenges? And in this context, I think it is an extremely important political momentum to talk about how to consolidate and unify and make Europe stronger. And I'm a strong promoter of bringing together the Western Balkans that we are discussing 20 years about the enlargement and also the Eastern Partnership, which today really is working hard to defend European values and become a partner of the EU. But also with the respect to what everything is happening around the world. This is extremely important. Last year when I was doing a campaign and traveling a lot to, to Central Asia, to Latin America, to Caribbean, to Africa, I realized quite often a strong criticism to the West. I was often faced by people saying West against the rest, or you are not respecting or being um, consistent when addressing other crises in the world. And we have to be aware of that. We have to embrace global side, global south. We have to speak with our partners and search allies more than ever before. So coming back to Europe, Europe is in a certain crossroad. We are discussing also with our citizens on the future of Europe, where we want to go, how we want to transform, how we want to reform, how to finalize the enlargement process, how to bring other countries from our neighborhood close together. We had the Blitz Strategic Forum not long ago in August. We hosted more than 2,000 speakers, not only from Europe, but around the globe. And that was a very important message. The Council President, Charles Michel gave, with a purpose it was in Slovenia. I said Blit strategic or Blit commitment, Blit pledge. 2030, it's the year the European Union can be and will be ready to enlarge. And this was a strong message to our partners in the Western Balkan, use 2030 year and get ready. And I think it is a political moment, looking the whole geopolitical context that we use this or we maybe fail for some next generation. Western Balkan today, which is also the topic of today's discussion, has been talking about joining the EU for the last 20 years. We've seen technical processes opening, closing negotiations. At the same time, we see lack of reconciliation in the region. We see also lack of consistent European enlargement policy. We see brain drain or we see young people living very in many numbers. We see growing nationalism, growing European skepticism, political, economical tensions, also consequence of the war in Ukraine with growing Russian propaganda, disinformation and influence. And in all these contexts, I think we have to start thinking out of the box. And I'm strongly committed to do everything as a Slovene foreign minister to convince partners in Europe, let us be this time consistent and let us work this enlargement policy. Let us be prepared. It doesn't need to have a change of treaties but it needs certain adaptations inside. And that we can talk later on. And on the other hand, to convince our partners that don't believe anymore in the Balkans, that the enlargement will happen at any point in time, to embrace them and push them through the reforms to be truly ready. I can see differences with the approach in the Balkan countries. Some take it serious, some less serious, but I think it's really a momentum we have to work and use if we want to see Europe strong. The Balkans has always been part of Europe, it always will be. And I think for the 
simple fact of protecting stability and well-being of our citizens, addressing together the global challenges. We need each other more than ever before. And the same, I mean, talking about the war and aggression in Ukraine, I can just say from the perspective of Ukrainians, everyone wished to see peace as soon as possible. We stand with Ukraine, we support Ukraine in its fight, we understand for territorial integrity and sovereignty. We have our Slovenic history, memory, um, no one by force can take your land away. And this is the bottom line, where we have to stand with a multilateralism-based value system, um, rule of law, democracy, but also UN Charter, when it comes to whether someone can by force change your internationally recognized borders. Um, that means long, just peace for Ukraine. That is something Slovenia will also strive for through the Security Council, but also in the relations, knowing what does it mean to have bloody wars in the Western Balkans, in our direct neighborhood, how important for us is to keep the whole region and to keep Europe really stable, in peace, as I still see it as the one of the best projects that also got Nobel Prize, sometimes we forgot in the past. Maybe with that, I could go in some details on what does it mean reform, what does it mean QMV debate. From the perspective of Slovenia, we have a lot of debates, but maybe at that point, I'd rather leave you to put questions that I will better know what your interest is. So thank you once again. Madam Minister, thank you for this, uh, not using your notes, but giving your ideas. Um, that's not always typical for a politician. Um, uh, but let me, let me try to challenge you a little bit, because otherwise we, we all ha are on the same page and it's sometimes it's good to have a discussion. Uh, you said uh, that uh, the European Union is too, too much looking inwards. Uh, it's not taking into account that uh, there are other parts of the world where with also problems like military conflicts, that the Global South has not been uh, treated on the same level that the European Union is not speaking with one voice in its foreign policy and things like things like that. Uh, do you see any positive developments and, and, and more outward looking of the European Union? Hmm. I will first start looking from the perspective of Slovenia, because during the vote in June we received, and there was another candidate for Security Council, Belarus, it was not a self-obvious campaign, but we received 153 votes, which was to our surprise uh, an amazing support. And that gave indication that our policy, trying to reach partners out, trying to embrace, and that was part of our campaign, let us go out, let us hear, let us listen, let us understand each other, what our challenges are and how to address them together, that these approach was the right one. So that's why I'm saying from Slovenian perspective, I, I heard so much criticism, you know, don't push us to choose sides. You are not consistent. You, you know, you don't respect values the same way. In India, we had some, you know, how to embrace global south. They felt neglected. Or in Africa, you know, in any part of the world, I heard a lot of criticism. And that also ring a bell with myself and also how we approach this Eurocentric. Of course, we take care for the stability and peace in our region first. And of course, we search for compromises in our region. But we are living in a globalized world, so any crisis around the world affects us sooner or later. So having this, you know, understanding of challenges and conflicts around the globe is extremely important. And how European Union is dealing, we are in the last 20 years going from one to another crisis. Or it's, you know, um, um, crisis, and I don't mention COVID, it was before crisis with 
um, economy, uh, with uh, our um, um, business, moral values, migration, name it. We, we went from crisis to crisis, and each crisis we didn't resolve it, but was already another crisis. And we somehow lost the focus, what are, you know, the fundamentals of European integration. Why this European integration years ago was created? It was created to reduce the conflicts on the, you know, on the ruins of the Second World War, to bring economies and countries together. And these basic values and this strategic focus we somehow lost on that way, just resolving crisis. But I still believe if we start now redefining where the European Union goes, people feel somehow far away from the discussions. They feel Europe is there giving us instructions. I see also narrative in my country. Whenever things go wrong, they say because Brussels said us so. They blame Brussels. When things go right, they say we did it fine. But I always say, you know, even small country, we can have a strong voice. We have our vote, we have our, if we know what we want to achieve. So today, yes, Europe is at a certain crossroad. Do we want more and more deepened European integration? Or we want to have more sovereignty? So I say from perspective of my country, yes, we want in a way deepened and more Europe on areas where we need each other. But also, we need a little bit, maybe, more sovereignty. Where are our strengths? So the discussion, and especially, we need to engage citizens. I lack discussions of what we want to achieve in Europe. We are a soft power, but the geopolitical focus today is in Indo-Pacific. Big rivals are fighting on different fields. Europe is not today there. We are lacking uh, with the you know, economic parameters, if you look to United States or other parts of the world. And Europe is not that competitive as it used to be. So we have to do it better. Some people say if Europe and the European Union can be competitive, it has to become an empire, <laughs> possibly a noble empire. Would you agree to that? This is most probably in Austria discussion. I never, <laughs> I, I, I never heard it in Slovenia, a <laughs> noble empire. Um, to, to me, sounds a little bit maybe um, not very positive. You, you understand idea. what I mean? Huh? That the term is yeah. not very positive, but actually. <laughs> but I do understand. That I would say it's a ignorance to the other parts of the world if you consider yourself. I think I like to say our policy is in a way humble. We need to be humble to really convince others that we are serious and we want to take you on board. I like to say to my partners, I met really a lot of interesting people from around the globe, including many ministers, when we discuss how to make our policy more humble and how to better embrace you. How West should be less ignorant also. So maybe from the perspective of a small country with not having too many big burdens from the past, it's easier to say. And that is, I think, why they also, many countries in Africa supported us. Because we were never some sort of colonial power. We were never, you know, having, you know, we, in fact, they remembered us still from the times where we were non enlightened But this is another story we are today having our, I would like to say, self-confidence and um, consistent foreign policy. But that's what I say. Noble empire, it's exactly what, it's a criticism that is coming from other parts of the globe towards Europe. So work together where it's necessary. Which is, I wouldn't say that it's always right. Because if you look in terms of investments, of soft power, of development projects, Europe is doing the most in Africa, because we try to really develop projects that benefit people, from water to infrastructure to education to empowering women and girls. This, I would say, we are front runners. Maybe our challenge is that we have a disinformation, heavy propaganda, and we don't somehow manage, which I see the same challenge in the Western Balkans, to communicate that we are the best donors, the best investors, bilaterally as the European Union, to really somehow boost, 
you know, infrastructure, education, schooling, hospitals, but somehow this soft power doesn't win towards the other ways of power. So no empire, that was a clear answer, very good. <laughs> If I, if I may turn a little bit to the European Union itself, I see two elephants in the room um, coming towards us. The one is money. When you think about discussion about Euro, the discussion about the policy of the uh, European Central Bank, the discussion about enlargement, um, turning uh, countries like yours from, uh, from um, net benefiters to net payers, um, uh, and the discussion about whether the European Union should have its own taxes. Uh, what, you, what do you say in all these money discussions about Europe? I can say that uh, last two weeks I sleep very bad because we have discussions on budget in Slovenia for the next year. And we <laughs> it's just going down. And it's just cuts everywhere. Of course, also due to the floods that we faced, extreme weather conditions back in August, and let me use the opportunity to thank also to Austria for amazing solidarity that we received during these um, heavy floods in Slovenia. But the money is always an issue, and if you look, um, I don't know, if you discuss about the budget in the European Union, um, it's always discussions that are the worst everywhere, because it's always how much countries will contribute to the common budget, and how much those that are poorer will get out. And of course, it's more and more difficult because countries more and more are in some, uh, you know, small circles or with national egoisms also trying to keep money for themselves. But talking, if you look about, about Austria, <laughs> it's a heavy discussion. You know, when I used to be parliamentarian, we were always very ambitious but the council always killed our ambition, so the discussion is everywhere the same. But I think if we don't invest sufficient money, just look now for a solidarity mechanism. It's an extremely important mechanism to help countries to make reconstruction after the floods, for example. Slovenia is trying to get money from solidarity mechanism, but this envelope is getting smaller and smaller. So if you want to really keep solidarity in Europe, we have simply to give much more money that, you know, richer countries will have to put better, you know, money for poorer, which is difficult to sometimes communicate. I remember the discussion with Poland or British when, or Britain when they were leaving the EU. It's not a la carte, you know, you cannot take only what you want. If you're part of some family, you contribute that everyone has some benefit from it. But it often now in EU you can see certain, you know, growing, I wouldn't say, um, it's egoism in a way in some countries. They would like to protect, it's, um, the discussion It's getting more difficult. The EU is also not the same as I remember 20 years ago when council agreed on something and it was implemented. Nowadays you have a council that maybe agrees on something but leaders go home and they do something else and not much happens to them. So it's, it's a challenge. I think we have really to start discussing from the scratch. What are these things that unite us and where we want to work together? I remember some year ago or two years ago the debate we had in Brussels. I think it was one of former EU leaders who said, you know, I went to make an exercise, and I went through all the capitals, and I had just my paper and a pen, and I asked every leader at that time, that was long in the past, what do you see Europe can have in common? What is the thing you want to see? And the majority of answers at that time was a common market, one single answer, and they started working that direction. Maybe it's a time to do such a reset, what is that we want to do in common, and what challenges we want to address together. And I think we have too many of them. You're already touching the second elephant in the room, the principle that everybody has to agree uh, in the European Union on fundamental issues. It's called unanimity principle. Mm -hmm. What's your position on that? Yeah, this is something what we um, see discussions and um, 
challenges we have with, um, especially in the field of common security um, foreign policy. QMV, so vote with QMV or not. Um, Slovenia, I mean, I decided um, to join friendship group, ran, I think, by Germany, to be open-minded on the possibilities how to make our foreign and common policy better, more efficient, without a veto on certain fields, which from the position of a small country, one would say, you're crazy. This is the only thing you have to secure yourself. But on the other hand, if you are not there from the very beginning of a discussion, we can neither protect ourselves. Discussion is there. But we have to see what are the safeguards also for small countries. You can discuss, you know, on different issues. QMV could be during the processes. You can have on some issue 50 times a vote. You can keep a veto at the beginning or maybe the end of the process, but in between. So there are a lot of variation how to discuss to, with the single and main purpose, how to make more efficient the system the vote, for example, on the field of common and foreign policy. We'll have a, a debate on that in the parliament in Slovenia on Friday, because I, I don't want to be, you know, the one who decides to uh, go through the parliament and we'll open a debate to see what are still ideas in that regard. But we have to think how to better adapt with today's life. And to avoid, if you look to the Western Balkan enlargement, we face too many times veto of countries on bilateral issues. And like North Macedonia was, in a way, a victim of bilateral issues. And today in North Macedonia, after failing so many times, and not because of them, people don't trust anymore and support enlargement. And this is the consequence. The governments are falling for that. We have to think maybe different how to make processes more efficient. So this was certainly not the full yes to unanimity. It was very differentiated. We are, we are at the beginning of a new discussion, I would say. And it's an important discussion. And I see that a lot of countries are thinking how to join it with certain, you know, still what is happening, what does it mean. But I think the discussion is there. It's better to be on board. Uh, Maybe uh, advice to uh, Austria. <laughs> I'm joking. Maybe an advice to Austria. We always take advice from our friends. Uh, not always from our neighbors, unfortunately, uh, by the way. Uh, uh, two small questions before I open to the floor here. Small questions. The first one is Balkans. Mm -hmm. The question on, on the Balkans. Let me start by asking you, um, uh, uh, in my context with Slovenia, um, your experts always used to say when I asked, um, is Slovenia a Balkan country? Is Slovenia a Central European country? Or is Slovenia a Mediterranean country? And they always get the answer, all of it. <laughs> so what is the position of Slovenia? If you look to the mentality of people, you know, you would say we are Italians when we eat good food. We are Balkans when we listen to good music, and we are Germans when we are very good in work, high quality work. So we are all. But apart from that, we never say that we are a Balkan country, we can say a Central European country. Um, even our Croatian friends say the same. Yeah, but you're interested in the Balkans because of for trade, for history, for culture, for everything. So how do you see, well, let's, let's be clear. How do you see at the moment the situation in the dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade? Um, very worrisome, seriously, especially after the incidents in uh, North Pristina, attacks on Kosovo police that we strongly condemned. Um, last weekend was, um, in a way, um, a big concern to us because we were not sure where the situation goes. Um, provocations or these incidents that even costed life are very serious. They don't help to any side. We called not only to immediately stop the violence and provocation, but also um, the return to the dialogue. Um, this is extremely important for, for both sides. 
Um, I'm closely following the, the situation in Pristina. Um, it is uh, certainly something that will be discussed at the next ministerial meeting, also in Bla Brussels, and uh, we are in touch with everyone, you know, special envoys are traveling to the region, everyone is engaged, no one wants to see further um, escalation of the situation in old Kosovo. So the back to the negotiating table and to the dialogue is very important. Minister, uh, uh, some people say, criticize that the Europe, European Union is always concerned about things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and there are no results. And I hear people already, f especially from Kosovo, who say maybe it needs a small Dayton to solve the conflict. This is for Bosnia and Herzegovina, I believe. Um, um, on Bosnia and Herzegovina, I could say, uh, of course, a lot of things too. It's another hot spot, um, another very volatile region where you have a um, constitution, when you have a Dayton agreement that um, ends the war but didn't make the country really functional. So you have there a lot of debates how to make the system more functional, one state approach um, and um, reduce tensions that exist there. So with Bosnia, we work uh, a lot, but the, the solutions, whether it's a mini Dayton, whether the same people sit together and find again a solution and certainly the solution has also be supported from inside Bosnia, it has to be accepted. I am not very optimistic, but we, with the new government, there is a good momentum because the new government was established very fast in Bosnia and Herzegovina, maybe the fastest ever, but also the budget and also five new um, legislation um, pieces were passed through, so they try. It's something that we have to embrace and support them, and Slovenia is technically financially supporting country to go through the reforms. I think it is a time that Bosnia and Herzegovina, by the end of the year, gets or starts the accession talks. This is what we try to achieve. Last year we managed to deliver a candidate status to the country. This year our goal is by the end of the year to deliver or to start the accession talks with Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think this would be a very important, also political message. And once you put the whole discussion, or you have Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, and you put, you know, decisions like the same goal is for Ukraine and we support it, start of accession talks by the end of the year. It's the same goal. And also accession talks with Moldova and next steps with Georgia. But um, at the end of the day you realize these are, of course, political decisions. And once you do political decisions, you can also do big mistakes. Because if we will consider only one part of having a positive political decision, and now I'm talking very personal, but then neglect a part you are talking 20 years about the enlargement, I think we will lose the countries of the region. And we will risk another war or instability in the Western Balkans. And this we have to keep also in mind, or bear in mind, when we discuss how to think out of the box to bring countries together. That's the, the pledge of, of the Blade Strategic Forum you mentioned already. You, you were hosting it at the yeah. time. And you, you said afterwards, that's the real chance now. Mm -hmm. um, I like your optimism. Uh, but we often heard that's a real chance now. Uh, so what are your arguments that with the Ukraine war, the new geopolitical situation, the, the realization of, of that, that it needs political will, that it's a real chance? I learned through my career that pessimism doesn't resolve the problems. Maybe that's the reason I'm always trying to be an optimist. Um, but also try to believe as long as there is a single person on the other side that believes the same. You know, I truly think if we don't now use this time till 2030 that is out in the space, it's clearly detailed why it's there. It's a next commission, it's a next budget. It's not an idea that is floating without a content. We can be ready. There is a perfect, or let's say, a good paper out from France and Germany that gives an idea 
how Europe should function, and we are still analyzing it, but I think it's a good basis. And on the other hand, also to push the countries, I can tell you some of the countries of the Western Balkans really saw an opportunity. It's for them very important to have a goal, a clear goal. They lost it in the last years. And um, whether I am naive or not, I am a fighter. And I see that a lot of colleagues in the EU start reflecting on it. It was the same last year when we, Slovenia, pushed out the idea on candidate status to Bosnia. I remember no one bought the idea. I was the one starting talking in the council. Three months later, it happened. So if it's a political will there, and if you manage to convince why it is necessary, I will continue doing so, and I hope we will manage to get like-minded countries on board. But also, it doesn't mean that the countries on the Balkans don't need to go through the reforms. Yes, they do have to go, and they have to go fast. And it's still the process that is based on your own readiness. But we have to support them. It's not enough to say pessimism, nothing will happen, another lost opportunity. It's impossible. Then we can forget it. Yes, uh, Michelle said in, in Plate, it needs both sides. Mm -hmm. You have to be ready at the latest until 2030. But then I listened also to the, the panel with uh, Minister Dacic from <laughs> Serbia. Uh, that was a very strange thing again. Not that he changed his, his mind, but he was talking about Tito, about communism, uh, about Serbia. Um, do you see that the partners in the region, really? <laughs> we are at a diplomatic academy. I have to <laughs> not to speak too sincerely, right? <laughs> no, but okay. Uh, um, um, honestly, I see different readiness or different belief, and I understand, I also understand the, the governments or politicians in the region that became highly skeptical, and also people. Because when you 20 years speak that you will join and not much happens, and you also just see opening, closing chapters, very technical process, not tangible results. We have problems with the communication and uh, to convince people now to go through the reforms. Even if we say the reforms are not for Brussels, they are for better life for citizens, they are for better functioning of the governments, institutions, the system. Today, they, um, some of, I would say, of politicians prefer the status quo. You know, you have fight against organized crime, against corruption, are different challenges that sometimes it's better to be just there to the extent that suits you well and, you know, deal domestically and be strong. I won't point finger out nowhere, but I just wish that the Balkan, that people, if you look at the young generation, where do they travel? They travel to Europe. They want to study in Europe. They, have Euro they want to live European values. They are Europeans. And for that reason, I think we have to push hard and make pressure on the governments to deliver. And this is what I think we have all to do. In the European Parliament, you worked strongly for the visa liberalization uh, for, the, for the Balkan countries, successfully. I, I truly, I work, I know the region very well, I have a lot of friends, I work with civil society, I work a lot with youth, and I really want to support countries strongly, I'm a big advocate of the enlargement, and also of the Balkans to be part of um, um, EU. On visa liberalization was the real tangible result. People were really feeling what does it mean that you can free travel with certain limitations, up to three months to EU. Because, you know, we were doing visa liberalization for mostly students, young people, people without money. Frankly, a lot of others, or if you speak about, I don't know, criminals or people with money, they were able to travel. But we were 
doing that for real people, that, you know, we opened the doors. And um, I'm so really super happy that we managed to conclude also visa liberalization for Kosovo, which in a whole political situation today, it's not an easy thing, but finally the council agreed, also the governments agreed, even though Kosovo met the criteria years ago, the commissioner recognized, the parliament recognized, but now, um, next year, I understand they will be part of a free travel. No, I think I think you are really a proponent for the for the opening and integration on on, on this side. Uh, but there are other countries you have to convince still. That, that's a long way to go. And let's hope that you that, that you will be successful. Uh, my last question before I ask is is actually a one about a bit a bit more basic. You are also party chairman. Uh, and uh, in Slovenia, there is, has always been a strong polarization between left and right. But there seems to be quite a, a left majority. When you see the last elections. But all around Slovenia, you have um, center-right majorities, from Italy to Austria, Hungary, um, uh, Croatia. Why is Slovenia different in this respect? <laughs> <laughs> we were simply better. I mean, <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I will not go in the past. I, I don't like uh, a year after to, to deal what went wrong with the previous government and why there was a strong sentiment in the population or in the society that there has to be a change. It was mostly related with the respect of the rule of law, of democracy, of open society, with the respect of civil organization, freedom of media values. That was, uh, people were on the streets and they demanded a change and that change happened. But why the so much conservative governments, or you see in Germany today, IFD on the rise. Topics we are facing, from migration to, to the crisis, or to the energy crisis, the Germany is struggling. Of course, these topics, the, the, the opponents that are all opposition, can very easily, you know, take on board, frighten people, scare them, manipulate them, and win on that. This is very easy. And I see always trends, you know, of growing populism, nationalistic rhetorics. I see in the discussion on migration. I'm always very worried, and I was dealing a lot with that for the last 10, 20 years. Migration, Europe has always been a continent of migration and always will be. But you always get, of course, we fail to establish common migration and asylum policy because the governments don't have trust, because very often this is a perfect topic to scare people, also manipulate, and, you know, increase fears even when they are not yet there. And in such an atmosphere, it's extremely difficult with arguments, with a moderate and, you know, well thought policy find solutions. Migrant will be there, migration will be there, and I like to say it's not a question or, or, of right or, or left politics, it's a question we have to address together as governments, as the EU, and a global wise. And um, populism is a very dangerous thing, and especially with the social media. And you maybe know very well what social media with disinformation, with uh, fake news, uh, with uh, narratives that are dangerous brought. Um, we are not that easy as politicians operating in atmosphere where it's a lot of distrust also in the um, policies. Well, I open up the floor for questions. We still have a few minutes time here. Let's start over there. So my name is Mark Bisser. I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina and I'm a DLG student at Diplomatic Academy. And I'm really glad that you came because we're coming from the territory of former Yugoslavia. I'd like to ask you maybe two questions. Uh, the first question is, how do you think that accession of Bosnia and Herzegovina in the European Union will benefit European Union? And also, what do you think about Bosnian diaspora living in Slovenia. Of Palestine. Good morning. Thank you, Minister, for your uh, uh, remarks. I'm the Palestinian ambassador to 
Austria and Slovenia. Um, in your remarks, you mentioned uh, several times the 2030, Charles Michel, famous uh, quotation. I was there, listened to him at uh, Bled. And of course, it takes two to tango. I mean, it needs that the countries that are willing to join should be prepared, but also the EU should be prepared to absorb this enlargement. Now, you mentioned very quickly Euroscepticism. I think this is one of the main challenges that is facing Europe, particularly because skepticism is increasing. The rise of nationalism in Europe is increasing. And I think one of the reasons is people feel alienated. There is this huge bureaucracy in Brussels that people don't feel connected to. Don't you think that as much as politicians speak about the reform of the UN system, that in the same context that people should speak about the reform of the European Union, the structures of the European Union. And always I can't avoid the feeling of, in times of crisis, this structure EU becomes shaky. Take the financial crisis 2008, then the migration crisis, then the pandemic. Each time, times of crisis, each European country starts to look inside. So I think, don't you think there is, it is about time to think about reforming the EU so that it become ready for enlargement? Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Veronica. Um, thank you very much, Deputy Prime Minister, for being here. Um, I have a more general question, I would say. Um, how do you see the world um, in terms of geopolitics today? What's the centers of power, which kind of conflict um, we have, if previously we would have uh, ide ideological conflict, what, how, how, what's your vision? Thank you. Madam Minister. Yes, um, thank you for all three questions. I think first and the second I can basically um, put together, even though the um, first one was uh, more specifically on Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, if we look what the countries of the Balkans will bring to the EU, I think it will bring a lot, especially if you look at the whole continent of Europe. If it's united and strong, we can be better capable of addressing global challenges that are the same in Bosnia and Herzegovina as in Slovenia or as in Germany. Not a single country not a big Germany or a small Slovenia or Bosnia and Herzegovina can tackle these challenges alone. And I'm speaking from climate change to you know, energy, food insecurity, um, terrorist threats. I think if we have inside the region of the Western Balkans a strong reconciliation and the work together through process, we can be also as a region or you stronger partner inside the EU. For that reason, I think it can bring a lot. It can also bring problems, but it's not many countries bring problems if you look to nowadays EU. But that is why the readiness has to be there with the reforms. And they are crucial for Bosnia and Herzegovina too. Um, when we speak about 2030 Blade Pledge and the reform and the enlargement in that context, we have to think about gradual integration. Countries of the Balkans today are not prepared to join tomorrow, but they are eager to say, why not to be observers to get better prepared in different processes? Recently, I spoke with a colleague from North Macedonia who said, we aligned our foreign policy completely to the EU foreign policy. Why not we are observers at the Foreign Affairs Council? In some council, this is already happening. And I think this gradual integration, observers, it's also a document of the European Commission, or common market, or other, it's important steps that we bring countries to 2030 better prepared. 
And this is also part of, in a way, the reform. You, I agree with you that the reform is needed, but now the question is, is it needed to reopen the treaties? That, I think, if you speak about the enlargement up to 10 members, new members, the way I understand the, refor the opening of the treaty is not needed. But still we have to think really well how we are prepared for the new integration. For that reason, are a lot of ideas circulated. We are very proactive in this regard because with the existing treaties, we can play with the commissioners, you can play with all sorts of things that the EU is still functioning. Whether it's ideal or not, I would love to see, you know, deepening or go in a more, you know, um, ambitious reform. But I don't think that opening the treaties is the best way in current situation, because it can also open Pandora box and not everyone would be happy. But I think you can do a lot of adaptation if political willingness is there. Bureaucracy in Brussels, I fully agree that our citizens are too far and they often see Brussels as a, you know, close political elite. I was myself often confronted how to better communicate European topics and bring it closer to the citizens. In Slovenia, we have one of the lowest turnout at the European elections. What we try now to do, you know, you have to put people, change narrative, communication. Europe is always something abstract and far, what I said before. But to bring some, you know, concrete tangibles, what Europe means directly and affects directly to your citizens. We now do a lot of, also as a ministry, debate on Europe because I lack this discussion in our society. It's always too abstract and too far. It doesn't concern us. We need, you know, it's, we are focused on how to improve lives of our citizens from today to tomorrow. But I think we now have to, if we want to really open the debate on the future of Europe, and we tried to do it, we have really to engage citizens, put people in the heart of the discussions. And this is what we will try to do in Slovenia. Um, our ministry will hold discussions on specific topics that will try to engage people, to really, you know, bring the attention what Europe is, what the future of Europe is, and what is the role of Slovenia in it. I think we need these discussions, and we need to engage people. It's always uh, extremely difficult, but me as a journalist, before I often was, when I was reading communiques or documents in Brussels, I had difficulties to understand it myself, let alone people. So a lot has to change also in the narrative and the communication, but also with the young generation. I like there is not a better education at schools, because for them, EU is self-obvious. They grew up with open borders, with possibility to study abroad, with Euro, with many benefits the EU brings. It's self-obvious, but they don't know why it's there. So with the young generation, we again have to open different debate, what the Europe is. They don't understand the world, they don't have this memory, and this is where I think we have to focus a lot. Um, the question but was geopolitics. on the geopolitics of today. Who will run the world <laughs> in the future? Um, I think I partially mentioned at, at the beginning, and um, I think the, the whole world today is focused, or at least the big powers, to Indo-Pacific. Even sometimes I feel some even forget that there is a war on European continent, but the whole boat is shifting to the Indo-Pacific. You have to... I would say, on one hand, United States, on the other, China, that are becoming not only, you know, partners, but systematic rivals. And they also are competitors in the influence in other parts of the world. There is a competition ongoing on the development, research, you know, China and India on artificial intelligence ahead of United States, and it's uh, investments, it's uh, also investments in military equipment. I had a very interesting discussion in uh, n South Korea not long ago with a former um, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who, you know, it's for me a knowledgeable and well-experienced man. And he told me very interesting, um, it um, gave me some thoughts, 
that um, China is um, announcing that in 12, 13 years it will be biggest military power in the world, bigger than United States. And he said, we have 12, 13 years time. And this is when you see how the world is changing extremely fast, that it's today we have, um, I'm worried looking from uh, the perspective of, you know, from European perspective, and maybe here I stop because I'm worried about, uh, the, you know, the development that is an amazing opportunity on artificial intelligence and science, but on the other hand, will it be in the right hands? Who will control it? What does it mean in a new, you know, world of um, um, arrivals or competitors? The same with uh, who is biggest military power and the development of new technologies and uh, weapons. So. These are all challenges we are facing, and then knowing that you have a Security Council with a lot of paralysis today, and uh, the veto power and the difficult um, decision-making system with a multilateralism that is not functioning and not being adapted to the current situation, this will have all to really think how to do it and adapt it to today's situation, and it will be a very difficult task. That is why also, as you mentioned, reform of the UN, yes, it's absolutely necessary, but also the reform of the EU and adapt to these um, global challenges. The world is um, really going very fast. Madam Minister, I think we have to thank you for this long journey from, <laughs> from small Slovenia to world politics. Uh, I remember one of your ministers visited Beijing, the government there, and then uh, the minister, the Chinese, looked at your minister and, uh, and said, you know, we are on the main square here in Beijing, and the whole population of Slovenia would fit on, the, on one square in Beijing. <laughs> um, but that, yes. that doesn't mean much, I would say. <laughs> but counts should be the ideas and how we, how, how we translate them into, into, into real work for our people. Uh, so I think we should all give a round of applause to, to Minister Fayoum. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.